Mrs. Sloan. Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Bear, Mr. Greenstein, Mr. Hohauser, Mrs. Nadolny, Mrs. Weisberg, thank you. Uh, before we proceed, I would just like to mention that Dr. Mooney is unable to be here this evening. She had an urgent matter to attend to, and she sends her apologies and wishes everyone a very happy and healthy holiday and new year. Uh, now make a motion for the adoption of the agenda, December 8, 2015. Do I have a second? Mrs. Johnson, all in favor? 6-0, thank you. And I will now move to student and community comments. I would ask that everybody please identify yourself for the record and remember that we will be holding to a three minute limit. Speakers this evening. Okay. Uh, I would just like the children from Manor Haven with everything going on right now in the world and our country. It's so wonderful to see all these beautiful children here together, reflecting our fabulous, diverse community filled with so many cultures and so many wonderful, happy, smiling faces. It was really a great way to start the holiday. So I'd like to Sorry. This evening will be the last meeting for our very wonderful board member, Mr. William Hohauser. And uh, before I say nice things about him, I believe he would like to have a thing or two to say? No, no, he okay. It's with great sadness that I've had to resign from the Port School Board. Uh, my six plus years here have been probably one of the greatest privileges of my life, and I mean that. Um, we just had a wonderful discussion upstairs in our executive session, philosophical. Uh, it's, it, I'm not talking about the subjects, but it's, <laughs> it's, the, po it's the point of, of being able to do this with a, a really wonderful group. And I can tell you that it's been, uh, it's, it's really been a delight to interact and to really think about serious issues and to discuss them and to come to consensus. And I give Karen and Nora Alan, Beth, uh, Christina, and Larry, of course, who I usually sit next to, um, a lot of credit um, for doing this. And Karen and Nora, I've got to tell you, as the two board officers, um, to do this with your ever-present smiles is, is wonderful because you, uh, you do this so gracefully and graciously, and I can only, uh, I can only thank you both. Um, it's, again, it's not, by, it's not by choice that I'm doing this. I am serving, uh, I am I'm actually assuming a position as a judge in Nassau County uh, as of January 1, and as a result, because of potential conflicts of interest, I am not allowed to serve. So uh, it's not by choice, but it's, the, uh, it's an opportunity to live out a dream that I have to become a judge. And um, I thank everybody in the board and the community for these six years because they've been really, really interesting. And I will still be attending meetings. Okay, so the warning. It's about six years. Oh. I just want to thank Bill. It's a, it's a good time of year to also recognize volunteerism in our community, and this is a really big volunteer job. And I've served with Bill for these six years, and he's been dedicated and devoted and cares a great deal about the children in our community and our school district. And um, as president for many of the years while he's served, I could say he's really given me a run for my money. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's been a really important part of the board and we will miss him and of course wish him well. And this plaque that we will give him this evening because this is what you get for serving on the board. Award of Appreciation presented to William Hohauser in recognition of your service to Port Washington School District Board of Education 2009-2015. Thank you.
I believe I really am not sure of everything Dr. Mooney wanted to cover, but I do know she would want to tell everyone to please check our calendar. We have a lot of wonderful concerts going on in the schools at this time of year around the holidays and a lot of exciting things. And just to thank everyone for a wonderful first half of the year as we enter into the second. And uh, I guess she would want us to do the enrollment. Thank you. Um, as of December 3rd, our enrollment is 5,458. We are 116 more students now than we were at the same time last year. Thank you. 116. Yes, yeah, it's growing. I moved off from Bill too fast and neglected to thank his wonderful wife, Sharon, because it's even more fun to be the spouse of a board member. So thank you very much for all this time. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes, a little applause. I am going to make a resolution now for the award of tenure to Deidre McCuey for speech from Guggenheim and Schreiber. Do I have a second? Mrs. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Fennick, do you want to, you, is she here this evening? Oh, good. Please stand up. Thank you. I'll take the vote so that we congratulate you. Any, uh, all in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Deirdre. I just wanted to congratulate you, and um, and of course you'll be invited to our tenure award ceremony in May, and um, just thank you for all the great work that you do for the district. It's really it's very much appreciated and it's noticed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I'll now make a motion for the approval of minutes for November 17, 2015. Second, Ms. Johnson. All in favor? Six zero. Oh, thank you. And we'll now move to the discussion item. Dr. Westervelt, if you want to open that up about the library research. Sure, good evening. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Ryan Maloney, who is here tonight with a team of librarians who will uh, present a very brief presentation on some of the wonderful work that is uh, being done. Um, so welcome, and uh, Ryan, I will turn it over to you. Good evening, member, members of the Board of Education, District Administration, and Port Washington community members. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you the wonderful things that are taking place in our school libraries. I'd like to just um, briefly mention the librarians by name. Kate Herz, Joanne Kukulis, Suzanne Modi, Janet Moser, Mary Ellen Noon, Kimberly Pinto and Mary Seligman. The school library or the library media center is often referred as the epicenter of a school building and for good reason. Our certified teacher librarians play a multitude of roles in their respective buildings and this brief presentation will share with you some of the details on the topic which include information literacy, collaboration, research, educational technology, and leadership. Good evening, I'm Janet Moser. I'm the teacher librarian at Sousa Elementary School. The heart of information literacy is reading, both for pleasure and for academic purposes, including research. We teacher librarians foster the love of lifelong reading by exposing students to various genres of literature, including multicultural resources. We conduct author studies and bring authors and illustrators into our schools. Resources are shared in varied formats, print, audio, and digital. And of course, teacher librarians are entrusted to develop our library collections 
to ensure that our students have access to current and engaging resources. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Ellen Noon, and I am uh, from Manor Haven School. And uh, the topic that I will be addressing this evening is collaboration. The teacher-librarian collaborates with all members of the school community. This involves grade-level meetings with teachers to plan, implement curriculum and research, and provide all the necessary resources. Keeping administrators abreast of current trends in information literacy, coordinating with our PTAs and HSAs on various school-wide programs, working with various community organizations, such as the Port Washington Public Library, to stress their importance. Good evening, my name is Mary Seligman. I'm the teacher librarian at Schreiber High School. This graphic represents the six steps of the research proce process. Students begin with the basic step of deciding on a topic, then move on to finding and using information, and finally to the higher order thinking skills of synthesis and evaluation. From the earliest school years, teacher librarians guide students through these steps. As they grow from grade to grade, the process gains depth and scope when at graduation, students are prepared for life beyond high school. Hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Kakoulis, the teacher librarian at South Salem Elementary School. And I'll be talking to you about 21st century skills, in particular, educational technology. The use of educational technology is fundamental to school library programming, including research. Technology skills are crucial for future employment needs. Today's students need to develop these skills that will enable them to use technology as an important tool for learning both now and in the future. Project-based learning and research in school libraries boost the effective use of technology. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Suzanne Lodi. I'm the library, uh, pardon me, teacher librarian at Guggenheim Elementary School. And I'm here to speak about, somewhere, there we go. Hi, nope. Leadership. I'm here to speak about leadership. As teacher librarians, we are on the forefront of our profession, adopting changes in curriculum and technology to improve student academic achievement. We participate in professional development at national and local level through the American Library Association, American Association of School Librarians, New York Library Association, and the Long Island School Media Association. Through presentations to our staff and community, we share materials and resources such as best books for the year, databases, websites. We believe that libraries are the most progressive space in our schools. Mary Ellen Noon again from Manor Haven. It's important to remember that certified teacher librarians bring our students into 21st century literacy skills. The students who are educated by certified teacher librarians achieve the overarching 21st century literacy skills. This prepares our students across all grade levels for future college and careers. Thank you. So we'd like to just take a moment to show you uh, a short video that I think well demonstrates 
the, uh, the scope and the dynamicism that happens in all our school libraries. School library movie special is a very important. Um, not only in New York, not only on the island, but of course the United States. And the most important reason is that they facilitate programming in the library. They also have a lot of information about resources and books that they provide to the school and its constituents. So not only do the parents use this, the websites, but the students, of course, for research, and even the teachers. The libraries reflect the, um, the, the style and the, uh, the passion of each individual librarian. You can go to one library and see a very clear focus on children's literature and literacy. You can then walk down the street and see not only those interests, but you see a very clear focus on technology and on uh, the integration of advanced resources in that setting, or multimedia being utilized to address all students' needs. As one building or a library is, is going on an African safari, another building is getting ready for a colonial path, where they're bringing to life colonial cars. Meanwhile, another library is actively supporting um, a wax community. It's important that we focus on writing and reading and verbal expression. Normally we have students walking in and out of here all day, every day, from the time they come to school till, until they're walking to their buses, they're still returning books and asking for books. It is a very active part of the building. The kids are really what make it worthwhile. Six audiences a day, no <laughs> And they all really love to hear stories and learning things and sharing things, and it's just a natural place to be. On an average day, we get anywhere from 11 to 1,200 students visiting the library. Um, in addition to that, students come in for research projects. I have materials that are for ninth graders, for struggling readers, for students who are new to the English language and the electronic materials, we have students all the time coming and asking for help to find materials. We have them coming to use the materials on reserve. I have quite a bit of that, and part of the reason I have that is I want them to get used to the notion of what a college library is going to feel like. That they don't wander into a college library and it's freshman year of college and not understand the system. It is this concept of the electronic doorway, and in the past, the electronic door really meant about access to online databases and resources. But I guess I like to swing that door a little wider open and, and really define the electronic door as opening up doors to students to have access to these resources so that they have an opportunity to use these resources, devices like a Chromebook or an iPad or a computer, traditionally speaking, to express their own ideas and to produce their own work. As a district, we have decided to spend a lot of our efforts to improve access to those resources. Those opportunities allow students to kind of enrich their instructional experience. The most important thing that I see uh, kids really um, excelling in and enjoying and really flying is the technology component. The project-based learning that we do and any of the research models and projects that we give them, they are so excited to use the technology aspect. So whether it's using Chromebooks to create documents, to create presentations or videos, whatever they're using to have that creative component to it, there's also the research component. And I think that all the librarians um, together work very hard to create these dynamic projects so that the students are able to produce these works and also have, have them for their digital portfolio going forward. They can come in and change what they spend during the day and have what they need when they need. And we talk about 
what makes a source a good source, you know, for them. We try to target them to databases because they're written for children. And we bookmark sources on the internet that we know are of good quality, provided by a good source, but really we just try to help them search and you know, take what they know and have them search for information um, in a way that's comfortable and willing to them but enhance their skills in the process. It is such a place of passion, of focus, and the work that is able to be done in the library, sometimes it's the only place that it can be done. Because of the space, because of the ability to collaborate with teachers, whether it be one teacher or a whole grade level, or a, a whole building itself, it really has the ability to pull together the community of learners around literacy, around books, with the integration of technology, but always through this approach that celebrates the human experience as learners, and it's something that is, is just profound. Thank you. So as you can see, on a lot of more than technology or 3D printing or computer coding, it's more than book exchange or story time. It's more than research and subscription databases. Our libraries are that magical place where all these things happen. It is that magical place where we celebrate each other and, the progression, and a progressive place that points to the future. Our libraries represent the best part of you and me. And I would like to thank the librarians for all they do and everyone here for their unwavering support. Thank you for the time this evening. I want to thank you for the presentation, all the teacher librarians and Ryan. I had spoken to Dr. Mooney about having this as our discussion this evening because a lot of people ask us about what it is that goes on in the libraries and we really wanted you to have the opportunity to speak tonight and showcase how wonderful you are. And as someone who has to admit I was on the board when we did have to cut the librarians looking for funding and luckily we all saw what a terrible mistake it was and so I'm so glad that you're all here tonight. Questions, anyone? No, no, yes, okay. Hi, thank you. Um, so in the presentation, the video, you actually showed a decent amount of technology being used. There are the Chromebooks and maybe iPads and stuff. I was just curious, at this point, um, how much is actually done on some sort of screen versus a hard book? And um, if we were to put money into library resources, would it be more on the aspect of technology or would it be more on the aspect of building a better Facility. library of books, if that makes sense? Well, I'll give um, all the librarians a chance or, uh, to, to also answer the question. Um, I think that, that there's a, a rich balance between um, and from my observations being able to go into the library, I really see um, a, a, a real focus on, um, on the, the works, the books, the research, um, about looking at everything from, from pictures and interpreting them um, as a information gathering component to um, uh, information uh, gathering skills, working with hard copy resources or online databases. But usually those, the technology component usually comes as a just-in-time component to, to take it to that next step or to, to bolster what they're doing with, with the existing resources in the library. Would any of you like to, Mary? At the high school, I try to balance print and digital. There's no question that digital costs a bit more money because uh, databases are more expensive generally than print materials. But almost every project that I work on with kids, they are required to use print materials. I'm a believer that this stuff is not going away. We are not going to get away from print. It will always be there. And I may be naive about that, but that's what I think. And I think it's important for a kid to be able to take a book in their hand and know how to use it and gather information. 
The topics that the books are not terribly useful for is some of the science research where kids need to get data that was created within the last five years. And that's where the digital resources come in. Um, I have chosen at the high school to buy digital reference books. The reason I did that is so, and you all go up to the high school library for your meetings before this, we have a reference section. There are books there. But the digital allows them to access that material any time of the day or night. And because I get usage statistics, I know some of our high school kids are getting that material at 2 in the morning when we're not open. And so that's the kind of material they will see at the college level, but they will also see books. College libraries are not ditching books. And I intend to keep that balance because I think it's important. I would like to add just a few words about that. For research, Mary Seligman spoke excellently about the use in the high school. At the elementary level, not only are we working on research, but we are exposing the children to literature and, as I said earlier, creating lifelong lovers of reading and literature. I thought as the years went by, my students would migrate to e-books and, you know, that would be the way of the book. The children tell me no. They want, when they're reading a pleasure book, they want a book in their hands. So the e-books do have a place and they do get used in a certain way, but the children seem to have the same mindset as me. When I'm reading for fun, give me that book in my hand. Um, it's a different kind of reading and, and it works. So a good mix is what we need. Thank you. I have one more question also. A few years back, as Karen alluded to, that we did cut li librarians to half time. Can any of you speak to how you saw a difference from going from full time to half time with the students per specifically and then going back to full time, what the, the advantage was with restoring you back to full time and what you saw with the students? I'm Mary Ellen Noon, and I'm from Manor Haven. And I think it was probably one of the most devastating things that ever happened to us. And, you know, when you come to a school library, and you come to any one of our school libraries, there are always kids in there. There's always kids in there. Whether they're there for reading, whether they're there for uh, research and when we were cut I was in Manor Haven for two days and I was in Guggenheim for three days we had two full-time jobs in two schools and every time you would walk by the library it was almost as if there was a death in the family because nobody was going in and just that feeling that the kids, where are you, Mrs. Noon? Where are you, Mrs. Modi? Where are you, Mrs. Mrs. Kukulis? Where are you, Mrs. Pinto? Where are you, Mrs. Moser? Did I miss anybody? Okay. It was really awful. It was awful. And the fact, when we came back, it was almost like the whole school came back to life again. And it's, it's growing more and more. And I invite, I invite anyone up there just to come in and sit for one day and see how wonderful our school libraries are. So please don't ever do that again. Thank you. Janet Moser again, Sousa Elementary. I always have something to say. Um, thank you for the opportunity. When our library program was restored, it felt great and it was like, okay, let's jump right back into it. And then I couldn't understand what was going on. And I'm like, what is the matter with my students? Why aren't they getting this? What, what is going on here? And why is my library a mess? Don't they know how to take a book off the shelf with a shelf marker? And yeah, I couldn't understand why they couldn't find the books. And then I realized that was just a small little sign of the damage that had been done by two years of the cut in the program. Can I tell you, I just now feel that we're back to where we were. 
that we caught everybody back on their skills, on their research, on their use of a library to locate information. So yeah, the, the effects of that were seen, unforeseen, revisited, and just we're just healing over now. So uh, thank you for the restoration. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, just a, a question. As, as far as connectivity, are we connected to other uh, libraries outside of our own system? For example, university libraries or other public libraries where we can connect into their research or look for books or things like that? Well, um, in terms of a, uh, a global catalog, we, we don't have a, uh, a unified global catalog insofar as we've made um, specific uh, relationships with outside organizations. Um, we, there is the Nassau uh, County Library System and the Nassau BOCES Library System, which is um, an aggregate of, of school libraries and um, community libraries. And um, there is um, different services that, that the district can take advantage of um, because of that. Um, there's probably some things that happen at the high school, and, and I'm sure Mary can, can speak uh, more deeply about those. Um, we have and we do meet with the um, Port Washington Public Library at least once a year, twice a year, or once a year, once formally. And so uh, we lay out um, and discuss, you know, issues and, and things that they'd like to do. Um, and there's always a discussion about uh, digital resources, let's say, like uh, subscription databases that um, our students are going to the, the public library after school. And so um, we've been working with both uh, district office as well as the, uh, the public library to um, come up with a, a few different proposals um, that possibly could be uh, benefited through some of the, um, the state funding sources that have been made available most recently. And so, um, so we are exploring that um, and thinking about better ways to um, give our students access to resources. One thing that we're thinking of to give you a, a, a perspective on it is to, uh, to build out um, our server infrastructure so that we can provide um, remote desktop access to our students anywhere in the world that they can get an internet connection. So they could go to um, a library computer at the Port Washington Public Library, be able to sit down there, go to one of our services, which is called cloud.portnet.org, which gives them access to um, a variety of different things, including their personal files, their U drive, as we call it. But inside that, that framework, there'll also be a button that'll allow them to launch a desktop, and it'll virtually push what they would see on a desktop when they're on site. And so because they're on site virtually, they would have access to our subscription databases without having to remember or have a physical card that tells them their username and password. So we're trying to break down the walls. You know, one of, one of the technology's thoughts as a department is that um, most of the time our students aren't here. And so we pay for devices and services and they're not being used because it's past three o'clock or it's a weekend or it's a holiday or it's the summer. So if we can extend those resources past our business hours, then we're doing a service for the community and the school district as well. But let me also ask Mary to come up and talk a little bit about some of her interactions with outside organizations. Thank you. Um, as just a point of information, I was an adjunct professor at Adelphi University in the library for 12 years um, while I was working here. I gained a lot of information from that job. I also gained contacts. So I access um, materials and, and from universities around the region. I have been able to get materials for students from the New York State Library. Um, I have, last year I had a circumstance where a student was leaving at three o'clock to go to the International Science and Engineering Fair and she did not have a single article that she had found that she had to have a copy of it and we did not have access to it here. I called in a favor and I got it for her. 
and those connections become very, very important to kids. Um, and it's not just the high-end research kids. It's the kids who are doing honors bio projects or kids who are, are looking at particular kinds of projects where the, the book materials, the print materials we have may not be what they need, but I teach them how to go out to WorldCat, find out where that book is, and I will contact that place either through BOCES or by myself and get an interlibrary loan. And so they do have a tremendous amount of things available to them. And just as a follow-up, I think you had said during the presentation that some 1,100 to 1,200 kids go through the library on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, are we overcrowded or out of room, or are we flowing that through in a fairly normalized pattern? I think it's in a fairly normalized way. Um, some students will come in for an entire period and work. Other students will come in, get the work done that they need to get done, and leave. One of the nice things about the design of that library is that we have somewhat of a section. We have a main section where we can seat 80 to 90 students. Um, we have the study carols, which we have designed. We, we manage them by telling kids there's absolutely no talking back in the study carols. It's one person per study carol, no talking. It's the only 17 seats in the building that are like that. The rest of the area is four students per table and there's talking. I by no means run a quiet library. It's not silent. Libraries today are not. They're dynamic, active places. We have the, um, the lab. There is a, the reason there's a table for eight in the middle of that lab is by design. One, students who are working on projects on the computer will oftentimes go back and forth to that table and they're working in teams. I have, that's the only place in the library where you can go in if there's no class in there to sit down with five people on a project and work comfortably. The reference section tends to be quieter and students will go back there to do quiet group work. Um, I can't tell you that there are empty seats every day. Some periods there are empty seats, some periods there aren't. If there is no empty computer, our kids are really good. If they're on that computer and they kind of finish their work and they're kind of looking at, you know, ESPN or something. If a student comes in and says, I need to have a computer for work, they give it over immediately. They really are very good about understanding, sharing those resources. And I just have one more. I'm sorry. R Ryan, in the question that you and I sort of swap almost every time you get Shanghai to the microphone, is there something in the combination of technology in the libraries that we're not funding? that if the funding were available that we would do, whether it be more subscriptions at the high school or other things at the elementary building that the buildings would want, but for lack of money, we're not doing something then that would support the 5,400 kids? Well, it is an interesting question. And I, I know that if, if, if I didn't you know, make mention that um, to get a, uh, a complete list of what that might be, uh, I would need to sit down with my teacher librarians to listen to them. But I think that some of the maybe low-hanging fruit in, in terms of an answer for this question would be, yes, access for subscription database, uh, some increased money would go uh, very far. Um, but also I think that if there were some more dedicated uh, educational technology resources, uh, because right now we start, we are at a, in a shared model of uh, instructional technology. For instance, the Chromebooks come as a cart, so we, we push a cart in, and it's a group of 30 uh, Chromebooks, uh, but that cart is shared across the building, so it might not always be available, and some concessions might need to be made there in terms of project planning and so on. So as we scale up, that would be, I think, a, a valuable resource that they have a a dedicated cart, let's say, for the libraries, that would be a, a, a positive. Um, if you'd like, I, I'd be more than happy to, to meet with and continue the discussion and, and we can give you a, a more a f full look at what those items might be. Yeah, it would be good just, I mean, we're about to go where we already started, but the right. budget cycle is upon us and it would be just interesting to understand the dynamic of that. and sort of, I'm making up the number, but what $5,000 does as far as subscriptions or those kind of things or what a cart really costs and if we do one a year for five years, 
is that a solution ultimately to rounding it out and things like that? Sure. Okay. No problem. Thanks. I think that ends our discussion and questions. Right, thank you, thank you again for being here tonight and for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to committee reports, policy, and personnel. Our last uh, policy and personnel uh, committee meeting was on November 18th, and we had a very interesting presentation on transgender policy that was led by our outside counsel, Howard Miller. And um, I think we may have something that will be posted on the website that talks about some of the issues that were discussed. I don't think it's posted yet, but we're going to do that. Our next meeting is on December 18th, which is, I guess, next week. December 18th next week? Next yeah, Friday. yeah. Next Friday. And um, at that time, Ryan will be back and we'll be talking about our webs the district website. And he's, um, I, I, since our last meeting about the website, I believe that Ryan has looked into some other districts' websites and we'll have some suggestions and we'll talk about ideas uh, for ways to make our website more informative, user-friendly, and uh, updated, um, and leading to better communications. Uh, before budget, I just wanted to ask, I forgot, Ryan, will you be able to post that presentation on our website that you had for us tonight? Thank you. Budget, Mr. Baer. Uh, we met uh, yesterday morning. Uh, we had a presentation by Ms. Wood about uh, infill material or uh, the need uh, to examine uh, crumb rubber as the infill material. And uh, we did that as part of balancing out the different presentations from different groups. We had some industry resources originally. Uh, this was from more of an environmental side um, expressing some of the concerns that have been growing uh, in various parts of the country on uh, what may happen with uh, crumb rubber made from used tires. Uh, so that was quite interesting. We also uh, have a follow-up presentation to that on Monday the 14th at 8.15 at the Daily Annex, which is the next 8? 8 o'clock. Sorry. Um, so don't be late for that. Um, and that will also be uh, still following up on the infill material as we try to cover that. A uh, couple other quick points. Uh, we have now sold eight out of our 10 parking spots. And so we are gaining momentum there and hopefully we will soon need more spots to sell as we have more people uh, looking for parking spots. Um, and that's I will just mention for Larry, the next curriculum committee meeting is the 15th, which is next Tuesday. Is that right? The 15th Tuesday morning at 8.30 at the Daily Annex, and it will be our second discussion on our enrichment programs. Just to let everyone know, it's, it's really going to be the feedback from the administration answering many questions we had had about our program, neighboring community programs, some statistics, it is not yet going to be any kind of recommendation. We have uh, ways to go, but we will be holding the next meeting. And we did have a very big turnout last time, so we were going to ask parent council and the presidents of the HSAs if they could just send word to try and be timely because it's such a, it was a big turnout. It was very hard to hold the meeting without disruption, so we would just appreciate it. And that we will have time at the end for comments and questions. So if everyone could wait until we get to that end so that we can hold our discussion during the meeting, it would be helpful, if you don't mind putting out the word. And the last meeting, what was the last curriculum? Oh, social studies. Yeah. It was great. We had it again today at Parent Council. So it was really good. Wow, was really nailing it the more time she does it. So it was really great, and uh, thank you for that. And that's it on the committees. So I will now move to the action items and move A1 through D9. Do I have a second? Mrs. John? Nope. Oh, okay. So we're going to do A2 through D9. Now do I have a second? Mr. Hohauser, maybe your last second. All in favor? 
6-0, oh, thank you. And now I'll move to item A-2. Do I have a second? A-1. A-1, sorry. Yeah, Mr. Well, Hohauser, do you want a second again? Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Five. Any opposed? Any abstain? Mr. Baird. Okay. Now we will move to old business. Is there any old business? New business. We are just going to discuss the sad open seat we will have now on the board going forward. And for the community's information, the board has a lot of discretion in this area. We can choose to hold a special election. We can just appoint someone of our own choice without any discussion. We can solicit resumes and applications from the community, or we can leave the seat open until May, which even if we appointed someone, it would only be until then, and then they, the seat would be open again for that election. So I, I myself feel that it's so little time that the person would be serving by the time we selected someone that we're probably best off waiting until the election so the community can speak for themselves about who they feel should fill that seat. And I did speak with Mr. Greenstein about it because he wouldn't be here this evening, and he was in agreement. I don't know how the rest of the board feels with the exclusion of Mr. Hohauser, who it's not appropriate for him to weigh in on this. So um, unless anyone has any objections, I think that's how we're going to proceed and hope that there are no major contentions that cause us to have a tied vote. Just also for everyone's information, if there is a tied vote, there is no tiebreaker. It doesn't, the resolution doesn't carry. So I think that closes that issue, unless anyone has anybody, anything to add. No, okay. Uh, we now have a second opportunity for the community to be heard. Do, does anyone want to be heard now? I see people getting up. We'd like to thank you very much for your service for the past six years or so. We especially appreciate your supporting the education for all children to ensure that they have a challenging and appropriate education. And um, we can't thank you more for your service. So good luck to you in the future. And we hope you still come to the meetings. <laughs> okay, thank you. Lynn, I, I really appreciate this. For those of you who don't know um, about me, and this Sharon obviously knows this, um, obviously I'm the child and grandchild of teachers, but one of the most important people in my life was a man named Bob Carter, who was a federal judge. He also happened to be the man who tried the Brown versus Board of Education case. And he was uh, my older daughter's, our older daughter's godfather. And um, it's, a large part in his legacy that, I, that I've been privileged to serve in this capacity. He was a wonderful man who sought educational equality and opportunity for everyone. And to the extent I could further that legacy in any way, that's, uh, that's a tribute to him. So I just wanted to thank you for letting me say that. You're welcome. <laughs> I think that we're adjourned, unless anyone I missed. No. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Yes. Oh, hi. How are you? Are you a new guest? Yeah, there was someone. Yeah, I'm over from okay. Do you, do you have my email? It's on the website. If it's on the website, I can. If you could just email me, and um, I can have your contact information. That would be great. Yeah. Okay.